I'm, I'm amazed that as many people are here today as are actually shown up because it seems like the Thursday before spring break in this class I've had attendance levels drop to about 20% because people decided that it's just a convenient time to use one of those free absences and we're going to go skiing in Colorado. I would say New Mexico, but there's no snow in New Mexico right now, so I was just there. So there's no skiing from Colorado. So one of the things that people have asked me after the second exam is, what can I do to do better? Um, first of all, what I would say is don't panic because, and I've had a number of requests after the second exam as, as the scores have not been what you want them to be, is don't panic because I do this in such a way as that there are enough points that balance out the exams that it's pretty easy to get a C or a B and here it's really tough to get an A. That's the way I sort of structure the class. So students come and they say, I've just got to get a C or I've got to get a B because I'm a business major and you have that requirement that you have to do a B or better in, in, the, in the core courses in order to, to get a, a business degree from UCL. So don't panic. But one of the things that I think you should do is as you think about and you go through the terms in the book is being able to own the information, not just being able to regurgitate it. And so, we're going to talk about brands and brand management, and products and product management today. We talked about new products last time. And I want to show you a video that helps me think about the way products in the product life cycle goes and brands and brand management are, are achieved. And it's a video by Marriott. Since I teach ethics, I won't skip the ad. It's a CNN video on the history of sort of Marriott. Business than we ever would in the restaurant business. 
What's the one thing that just surprised you most? The fact that we could grow from one hotel to 3,700 hotels, that really shocked me. I thought, you know, it took us seven years to build five hotels. And I thought, well, maybe we'll get to 10 or 15. And at what point did you look over your shoulder and think, ooh, well, where did that all come from? <laughs> Every day. <laughs> <laughs> The rapid growth was achieved with a formula <coughs> that has come to define today's hotel industry. Many brands, all under one umbrella. 1981, we had a lot of big box hotels, big city hotels. Somebody said, you know, we're going to run out of great locations where we can build these big hotels. we got to do something to grow the company. And let's go and build a hotel for the businessman. We did a million dollars worth of research. We asked. Our customers, what do you want in a hotel? They said a better room and a lower price. I said to our people, are you kidding me? You mean we spent a million dollars to find out people want a better room and a lower price? So we built one. We built a 150 room courtyard in downtown and in the suburbs of Atlanta. And then all it goes from the, uh, the courtyard, Fairfield, to the new I think it's Carlton. That's right. Yeah. We have 18 different brands. Too many? No, we, we keep adding. We just added AC hotels in Europe. If we find another niche for a, a brand, we'll, we'll develop another brand. The job of creating that next brand falls on the company's new CEO, Arnie Sorensen. His task is to keep the Marriott giant <coughs> moving with the times. What we see as the future of the core Marriott Full Service Hotel is a place that obviously provides a great night's sleep, it provides a comfortable room, but it also provides public space which can welcome people and which can invite them to read and have the lobby. Customers are saying it's no longer enough for me to have a great night's sleep in a big room and in a clean room. I want my senses excited in some way. Exciting the senses in that way demands a new brand and a controversial move for Marriott. Partnering with Ian Schrager, celebrated arbiter of cool, credited with inventing the boutique hotel concept. The Paramount, the Mondrian, the Sanderson, the Hudson, the Gramercy Park, and now, in this unlikely partnership with Marriott, comes addition. The idea is to kind of rethink the hotel business and do the same thing I did 25 years ago when we invented the boutique hotel. That's the point. 25 years ago, you invented the boutique hotel. It's been done. So what are you going to add to it this time? This is not a boutique hotel as such. That was a different animal that we created. But the whole idea of doing a hotel, it's supposed to manifest popular culture and who we are today in the same way people do with cars and technology and movies and theater and, 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 and music. It's the same kind of thing in popular culture. Update. Okay, so what do we now want today? We want something very unassuming and very comfortable. We're not looking for design on steroids. We're looking for good old-fashioned, good taste and good style and great service at a reasonable value. Together, Schrager and Marriott hope to achieve what has so far eluded the big hotel companies, with the exception of Starwood's W, the lifestyle of boutique without compromising the good night's sleep. What's happened in this space broadly is that the folks who are delivering this lifestyle experience are not also delivering great customer service. Even, even Ian would say the great hotels that he started in the early 80s and continued in the 90s offered a wonderful design and a wonderful nightlife, but a lousy night's sleep. The message echoes clearly from both camps. No more style over substance out with design on steroids, in with style and comfort. So, as I've asked you before, will you have a chair that's comfortable that I can sit in? Oh, good point. Because <laughs> you know me and my chair, and no twin legged chair. No twin legged chair. No twin. No twin. No a uh, chair I can sit in. Very comfortable. I'm comfortable. You can work in it. And a desk on the desk. Yeah. 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 The green it, and it's good lighting. Ooh. All of the things that... Have you grown up? I've seen that blown up. The brand launched last year with hopes to grow in the concept quickly into a chain of dozens of locations. Yeah. You sold out a chain. 
Marriott, you would have walked over hot coals rather than done a deal with a chain. I, I would have uh, walked over hot coals rather than to sell out. But what Marriott offers me was something that I couldn't really do before. So to me, it's the opposite of selling out. It's like, hey, let's come up with this great idea and let's keep it to ourselves and the family and do it. Coming up after the break, a good night's sleep with our Hollywood star, Richard Gere. His bed and breakfast. All right. So I show you this as a way of demonstrating. We'll go through the chapter and think about it in terms of the Marriott brand. So what I, what I say is you have to own this information. This is the way you should own it. You should be able to apply it to things that you know in your life. So I know about the lodging and, and hotel and tourism industry. And so I'm going to apply this to the concepts that we'll talk about in managing products. And also, this ties in well with what we, we looked at last time in terms of developing new products, those new product lines. So think about that in terms of the Marriott. And I'll, I'll ask some questions as we go along here, and maybe there'll be some opportunities for bonus points. So products like people have life cycles. You're born, you grow up, you go through adolescence, you get a job, you achieve middle age, you retire, and at some point you expire, right? So that happens with, with brands, that happens with products. They go through the same kind of stages. Now whether or not that life cycle is short or long um, depends on the type of product that you're talking about. Beanie Babies had a very short life cycle. They came and in, launched into the market. They became enormously popular. People were trading Beanie Babies for you know, more money than gold, uh, almost. And then they died out almost as quickly. So think about the products that you've had experience with and their life cycle. So it generally looks kind of like a, a hill, the product life cycle, if we think about it. And once again, some of these kept the markers that are no good. I don't know why people have this aversion to throwing away markers. I'll grab a couple. So you have introduction, growth, maturity, and then decline. And I asked you to, you know, think about Coca-Cola last time. So in the introductory stage, sales grow slowly. You have to introduce the product. You have to get buy-in from consumers. You get to, to try it. Depending on the level of risk that's involved, uh, the life cycle or the introduction in, in the life cycle may be really uh, slow or it may be enormously quick. What happens now? So the first iPhones that were introduced. The introduction of the iPhone was, if you think about that first iPhone, the iPhone 1, uh, the introductory stage took quite a long time because there were a lot of people who were not willing to spend the kind of money that iPhone was charging in order to, to, to get a device that they weren't sure really benefited them. Now, almost everybody, it's no longer just a luxury having a smartphone. Almost everybody, particularly of your generation, is going to say that this device is not a luxury. It's a necessity at this point, isn't it? You need it not only so that you can have a phone, but also as a what? It's, it's a way of keeping track of everything. How much of, you, how much of your life is on this device? How many of you keep your schedule on this device? How many of you check your email on this device? How many of you look at social media, surf the web? How many of you primarily surf the web on this device now, yeah, as opposed to your laptop? So in the early stages, when the iPhone was first uh, introduced and when the sign um, smartphones were first introduced, a lot of people didn't think that they needed it. Now it's not become just a want or a toy. For many people, it's become a necessity, particularly in business. If you're in business, this is you're, if you're traveling, this is the way you keep everything in one convenient location. And so it's, it's become more than just a, uh, a want. It's become, in many instances, a need. But initially, the smartphone, it took a long time in that introductory. 
Now, if we think of it not as the smartphone in general, but as in terms of the specific uh, stock key unit, which is like the iPhone 8, how long does the introductory stage of an iPhone take now? Well, they're going to release a new iPhone almost every two years in order to try and get people to, they cannibalize the product. So what's the introduction in, in the iPhone now? Initially, how long was it between the release of the first iPhone and the second iPhone? Anybody know? I don't know, it wasn't two years, so I can tell you that. It was a lot longer in terms of life cycle. Now what is it? What's the introduction? What's the introduction stage going to be? When they release the iPhone 8, they released the iPhone 10 almost on top of it. The introduction, you know, like the introduction of, of that product was 60 days, right? And then it's going into um, the growth. What's the stage of the iPhone 6 now in this country? It's a decline. If we went back again 10 years ago when, when smartphones were still somewhat of a novelty, it took a lot longer. People kept these devices a lot longer. How many of you keep a device more than two years? Why? You don't drop it? Break it? Flush it down the toilet? Accidentally? It's expensive? But it's, it's, it has slowed. So this, when we, when we started with the iPhone, it, it looked like this. Now, the cycle in terms of new is probably like that. Profits are minimal on the introductory stage. Now let's think about the Marriott Hotel. What stage is Marriott Hotel? If we think about the first Marriott, which were this motor hotel, what stage of the product life cycle? So their first hotel was a motor hotel. What's a motor hotel? Anybody know what that is? It's a rather old fashioned term. This point in time, so it, was it was it was more than a motel. So back in the 1950s and along Route 66, you saw what were called motor ports, which were motels, and it was basically you had a, a building that was kind of in a box U shape, where you had something like the office here, and then, you know, hotel rooms here, and then hotel rooms here, and in the center there was parking and maybe a pool. And they were cheap. They were convenient. You could park right in front, and they were usually one story. You could park right in front of your door, and you could get up in the morning and leave. Why are these no longer popular? You still find them in some places, by the way. And in some places, they become almost sort of among your generation who want experiences, kind of shabby chic experiences to go. You can find them still in New York. In places like uh, Lake George, they still have a lot of motor port hotels that they've sort of updated so that they're, they're not sort of the trashy you know, dump. They've got kind of hip, swank, you know, designs and purchase, but they're using those old buildings. But what happened that led to the decline of this model? And so the motor hotel that Marriott built was, it wasn't a full service hotel. So he talked in the video about the big box hotel. And that's what, after they went from the motor hotel, Marriott started really going into, which was sort of the full service luxury hotel that you found in a downtown like downtown Washington, D.C. or Oklahoma City. What is a full service hotel? Why was Marriott so successful? Marriott, Bill Marriott, does anybody know what religion he is? No. He's LDS. What is LDS? Mormon. Yeah, Latter day Saint. He's, he's LDS. But they recognized. That in particularly in large downtown areas, there were large Jewish populations, and they needed places to hold. Jews will spend, and I know this because I'm Jewish, will spend enormous amounts of money on historically bar mitzvahs for boys. Girls historically didn't have the same kind of ceremony that they went through um, when they turned 13. Uh, in Reformed Judaism, which is what I am, they do have a ceremony for girls. It's called a bat mitzvah. When my sister-in-law was bat mitzvah, 
We had the Bachmans of a party. This was before she was my sister-in-law. She grew up with my brother. My brother and his now ex-wife have known each other since they were six years old. We had the bat mitzvah at a Marriott property, and why was that? Because in Oklahoma City, Marriott is the only hotel chain that had a kosher kitchen. So it's a full-service hotel. They, did, they had everything from a kosher kitchen for uh, people who were Jewish that wanted to have their weddings, bat mitzvahs, bar mitzvahs, and things like that at their hotel. They have restaurants, they have uh, salons, and spas, and all of that. What has happened to that market in general, what, why have they run out? It's not just that they run out of locations for these big box hotels, but what does that cost if you want to stay at a property like that? Well, it costs a lot of money. And people want what? What did he say in the video that they wanted? A better room and a what? Cheaper price. And a better rate. So, you know, where are the big box hotels? How many of you have stayed in a big box hotel the last time you traveled? Or have stayed in a courtyard? by Marriott or a residence inn or something like that that's not a big box downtown hotel. Right? So where are we in terms of the, the life cycle of the big box hotels? In many respects, they are maybe in their maturity and on the decline because that's not the way people travel anymore. They don't go for extended periods of time to stay at these sort of, you know, unless it's a theme destination, where are you going to find that kind of full service stuff? Well, you find it for largely no longer so much business travelers, but luxury travelers who want to. So where are you going to find those kinds of resorts? Well, you find them in places that are tourist destinations like the Bahamas, Key West, things like that, where people want to have a salon. They want to have all of those amenities. But in terms of business travel, downtown historically, people now want, um, you know, they don't necessarily care about having the great restaurant and the salon and the spa and all of that in their hotel rooms. So, in the growth stage, you get a rapid increase in sales. Competitors begin to enter the market. So what's happened? iPhone became the big major player in the smartphone industry. And that has attracted the attention of other people that say, hey, I want a piece of that action. And so you now have Google that's entered and is trying to get a piece of the smartphone business, Samsung. Um, who was one of the first developers of, of cell phones? And they, have, as a result, are maybe in the decline stage. Motorola. Motorola is one of the first to develop uh, cell phones. And they're not a big brand anymore. They, they've gone into decline. Is that a question? In the maturity stage, you see a total, a <coughs> slowing in total of industry sales. So what you're seeing in those big box hotels is that there has been a decline in the revenue in a lot of those properties and hotel chains have started to go to the suite hotel, which offers these amenities, but not the whole services of the, the, the restaurant and things like that. Your marginal competitors begin to leave the market. Some competitors, so for example, when I was growing up, one of the biggest names in the hotel industry was Holiday Inn. They've had to reposition their brand. Otherwise, they were going to go broke. They were facing uh, a, a possibility of bankruptcy in the 1990s, and they had to come out with IHG, and they've re sort of rebranded themselves. But your marginal competitors leave the market. The profits begin to decline. So again, those big box hotels, one of the things that Marriott has done is they've had to start thinking about what people would rather do is there's been maybe a decline in places like New York City for those big box hotels as people don't want to spend that amount of money. In the declining stage, you have sales drop, and companies may um, begin to harvest products. So that's what they do. What is Apple doing with their iPhone 5 and 6? They're harvesting. They're not advertising heavily. Where are they selling those products? Is there a What? Yeah, 5 and 6. They're selling them to uh, elderly people, for the most part, who don't want the latest and greatest necessarily in technology. They're also selling those products as they begin to decline in uh, developing in developing nations, where that technology is still. So you know, it's they've now cheapened it. They can sell it in places like China and India, and their their profit margins there are still pretty good on those. But they're harvesting those um, those products. The length of the product life cycle, again, there's no set time. I talked about this. It can be like this. You can have this gentle sort of uh, 
intro, growth, maturity, and then decline, or it can be like a fad which will enter the market and take off and go into a decline fairly quickly, things like Beanie Babies. What's an example of a fad that you all have experienced? That you can think of? Hoverboards. Right, they became enormously popular, they entered the market, and then all of a sudden, anybody using them now, what, what happened to them? They started catching on fire. It turns out they weren't manufactured very well. They were sort of cool and hip as a, as a Christmas gift for kids. There was another problem with them besides the fact that they caught on fire. What, what led to them being a fad? Yeah, they're, they're extraordinarily dangerous. Anybody read, written one? They're, I mean, it's amazing the number of head injuries that were resultant of um, the hoverboard. So that's an example of a fad. What's an example of another fad that you all have noticed in your own lifestyle, like in your own lifetime? Again, finding these examples so that you can own this material. Yes, what was that? Um, I said Fortnite. Fortnite, what is that? It's a recent fad. It's a recent fad. It's a game. It's a video game. Okay. It, it came in, and uh, I have. I guess this one was so short-lived that I hadn't even heard of it. Uh, I, I, I normally know about these things because my niece and nephew play video games, and so I hear about them. Um, what about a lot of the King games along those lines? Candy Crush. People, everybody was addicted to Candy Crush. Everybody was addicted to Angry Birds for a while. And does anybody play Angry Birds anymore? They came out with an Angry Birds movie. It's an, an attempt to extend the life cycle, the life cycle of a brand. The shape of the product life cycle often determined, is often determined by the learning that's involved. So again, if you think about this, when my mother bought our first computer years and years and years ago, for her real estate company, actually, it was for a business that she had, people kept computers for an enormous amount of time. They were very, very expensive. Printers were very expensive. I remember the first printer that we had that went along with this computer. It was called a Diablo <coughs> 1000. And it actually had this thing called a daisy wheel. So it would print. The printers uh, that, were, that were less expensive at the time when I was growing up were called dot matrix printers. And they used this computer paper that you've probably seen that came on a track and it printed in a dot kind of matrix. It wasn't professional print quality. If you wanted to have that professional print quality, you, you bought a Diablo printer. And this thing had a daisy wheel, so it looked like a typewriter wheel, and it was it was so loud, because it would type so quickly, that it came with a specially manufactured soundproof box that you put it in so that you wouldn't have to hear it. So it took a lot of learning at that point in time when I first started working on computers. You had to actually know something about code in order to to use them, even for word processing. You couldn't just click on an icon that centered your headings and things like that. You had to know something about code, so you put like at, the, the at side, in parentheses, um, at center, and then in parentheses, the, the stuff that you wanted to do. So there was a lot of learning that was involved. Now, with regard to computers, <coughs> is there much learning that's involved on your, pa on your part when they release a new model of computer? Most of the stuff that, that has taken place in the computer technology world is stuff that you don't even notice. It's just things like increasing the processor speed so that you don't have to wait. Going to a web-based uh, platform so that everything's on the cloud so that they can A, data mine uh, your, your information, and B, it, you know, make money selling you storage. So um, some of the things that affect these life cycles are the learning, whether it's a high learning versus low learning product, the, the class and the form of the product. So products enter the market if they're low learning products. What's the big Disney film this year? Every year they release a big Disney film. And for example, they also release all kinds of consumer packaged goods that go along with it. So several years ago, Frozen was the big Disney film. And they released Frozen cereal by General Mills or Kellogg's. One of those brands did that. And when Frozen is no longer popular, what will happen? To the frozen cereal, you know, basically, what is the frozen cereal? It's sort of like a takeoff of Lucky Charms. Right? It's got some marshmallows in it or something, sugar puffed rice. But it, it will leave the market when frozen is no longer the big kids' move. 
Branding and brand management. Brand scholars like Kevin Lane Keller argue that branding is the most important decision a company will make. Again, you should know that scholars have a tendency to be enormously solipsistic. They think that everything can be explained from the perspective of their discipline. So branding scholars, which is a subfield of marketing, will tell you that branding is the most important decision a company will make. I don't think that's true, and I'll tell you why. I took a lot of, when I was a lawyer, I took a lot of companies, when I actually actively practiced law, I took a lot of companies that had great brands, they developed great trademarks, and I took them through bankruptcy because they had really crappy products, or they had really crappy service. So branding is important, but it's not necessarily the most important decision that you'll make, because if you have a crappy product, your product and your company are probably going to fail, even if you have a really great brand. But Kevin Lane Keller, and this is a test question usually every semester, will argue that branding is the most important decision that a company will make. So it's been a major topic of research in the field of marketing, brand development, and brand management. And most of the research in this field is focused on large companies like Marriott. How did you come up with the Marriott brand? Well, it was based on their what? Their last name, Marriott name. So what is a brand? Well, a brand is like Marriott. It's a name, term, sign, symbol, or design that identify the goods or services of a seller. And it's important. Brands provide a mental connection in the mind of the consumer that shows that they develop this position idea based on the brand name and the mental images that they get when they hear things. And so I've been talked a lot about, uh, for example, McDonald's. What is it that comes to mind when you think about McDonald's? Well, it's cheap, fast, consistent. They have good fries. <coughs> it's not necessarily high quality, things like that. What is it that comes to mind when you hear the name Marriott. Before you watched the Marriott video, what would you have thought of if I had said Marriott? You would have thought what? Hotel. In terms of the pecking order or the luxury level of the hotel, what would you have thought? You would have thought it's average? Okay. You don't think it's exceptional? What would you think is an exceptional hotel? In your idea. Who owns Ritz Carlton? Marriott. Right? So what else would you, what would you think of as a lower end motel, or hotel, lodging establishment? Motel 6, we'll keep the lights on. That's one. Super 8, what about IHG, Holiday Inn? So a mental, a mental connection in the mind of the consumer. Positive brands can lead to extreme gains in company performance. It's estimated that Coca-Cola is the most valuable, or for years it was, I think it's actually lost out again this year to being the most valuable, but for years and years and years, it was estimated that Coca-Cola was the most valuable brand in the world. When Jimmy Carter was president of the United States, his attorney general, Bell, had been the chief general counsel for Coca-Cola. His commerce secretary had been a president of Coca-Cola. His um, Secretary of State had served on the board of Coca-Cola. And what was the first product that we sent to Communist China after Richard Nixon opened up China? Coca-Cola. It was called the Coca-Cola Connection. And so that kind of iconic brand can have really good uh, gains for a company's performance. So branding can assist in the mind of the consumer in making decisions because they identify certain things with the brand. So in developing the brand, Turley Moore suggests that the following elements are important. It should be short. Why is Coca-Cola one of the most valuable brands in the world? Well, it's not just Coca-Cola. What what's the shortened version? And they use that as a brand and trademark as well. Coke, is that short? Yep. Easy to spell? Yep. Easy to remember? Yep. Distinctive? It's pretty distinctive. And in fact, Coca-Cola, it's not just the name that's associated with it. They also engage in trade uh, packaging. And so you can get trademark protection on certain designs. So I used to do this experiment in this class where I would have a brown paper bag and I would put a blindfold on a student and I'd ask them to reach in the bag and identify the product, and it was always a Coca-Cola bottle, and they would always get it right because the Coca-Cola 
they trademark their trade. It's called trade dress. Um, they trademark that bottle. And what's distinctive about the Coca-Cola bottle? It's the shape. Right? Pepsi can't use that shape of bottle. It's sort of an hourglass type uh, shape in the bottle, and so they actually have trade dress that go along with that. Distinctive, and it should not carry any negative associations. Now, this is one that can happen to you accidentally. What has happened to a number of sports teams? So, I graduated from Oklahoma City University School of Law. What did Oklahoma City's mascot used to be in the 1980s and 1990s? Anybody know? Anybody know what their mascot is now? Nobody knows what they are. The stars. They're the stars. That's right. How did they get the, the mascot, the stars? You forgot. There's a building on the Oklahoma City University campus called the Gold Star Building. And so they decided to use that as their mascot when it became politically incorrect to use the former mascot, which was a what? It was the Chiefs. They were the Oklahoma City Chiefs, and they had this Native American in the sort of stereotypical full headdress as their, as their, as their trademark, or as their mascot. At the time they adopted that mascot, that was not a terribly controversial thing to do. But what has happened in this field broadly? Well, actually, the trademark office has started to say they're going to, they are going to cancel the trademarks of companies that use that because it has a pejorative connotation towards Native American populations who object to it. So what's the most recent controversy in this? The Redskins. And they have, they have demanded, Native American populations have demanded that the Redskins change their name. And what has the team said? No, they're not going to change their name. They're not going to. They're not going to abandon it because they've got such loyal followers that they're that the branding would be impossible. They have actually lost the trademark, though. What does that mean for them in terms of their products? If you have a trademark and you have it registered and you are on the principal register, you get protection, and then you can decide who licenses those products. Anybody can license. Anybody can take Redskins products now as a result of them losing their trademark protection and market it. So it means that you lose the ability to control things like the cap that you're wearing. Nike has the trademark on that. I will tell you that Nike did not manufacture that cap. Nike doesn't manufacture anything. They're basically a brand new company, but they license that and they make a huge amount of money off of the licensing of that and controlling that trademark. Now, Florida State, what's their trademark? The Knowles. Why haven't they lost it? They actually have an agreement with the tribe to use that as their trademark. They actually have an agreement with the Florida Seminoles. So there are two sets of Seminoles, by the way. One tribe is very, 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 very wealthy. There are Seminoles in Oklahoma. So there's the Seminole tribe in Oklahoma. Where did they originate? They originated in the same place that the Seminole tribe in Florida originated. In Florida, the Florida tribe are the people that retreated to the swamps or the Everglades in order to not go through Indian removal. And those that went through Indian removal became the Seminoles in Oklahoma. The Seminoles are one of the five civilized tribes here. You should know that. If you've been to Oklahoma history, it should become tripping off your tongue. What are those tribes? Cherokee, Chickasaw. That's right. Cherokee, Choctaw. There are four C's and an X. Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek, and Seminole. The Florida Seminoles, the ones that stayed in Florida, are an enormously powerful branding powerhouse. And they actually own a, an iconic brand that you all probably have, have gone to and visited in your life. It's called, anybody know? Hard Rock. Hard Rock Cafe. Yeah, they own the Hard Rock brand. Hard Rock started in London, and they bought it. And so they're an enormously wealthy, wealthy tribe. So the Redskins have a negative connotation. They've lost their brand. I wouldn't have thought that Florida State could have kept it, but because they have this agreement with the tribe, it doesn't necessarily know what's the, what is the difference between the two. I'm not sure, but you want to avoid these negative associations. And, at, and this is an example of how you can get a negative association just as a result of a development in time. It would have been very easy for Coca-Cola to actually have gotten a negative connotation with regard to the development of their brand. Why was it called Coca-Cola when it was first manufactured? What was the ingredient that was in Coca-Cola? It had cocaine in it. Cocaine has generally got a very negative connotation 
But by the time that cocaine started to have a negative connotation, in the mind of the consuming public, nobody associated Coca-Cola with cocaine because it had been taken out of the ingredient list for years and years and years before that. And so um, it avoided that negative connotation. So sometimes these negative associations can happen to you, and then you have to figure out how you're going to correct it. In the case of the Redskins, they basically said what? We don't care that we're being insensitive, and we don't care that the Native American population wants us to change. We're not changing it. That has consequences for them in terms of losing their trademark. So Turley and Moore suggest a typology of brands. They say there are five basic types. There are descriptive brands. Coca-Cola, so this is an example of how you can own it. Coca-Cola actually started out as a descriptive brand. Their trademark described the product. What was the product? It was a carbonated, caffeinated beverage. That is the definition of a cola, a caramelized, carbonated beverage. That's the definition of a, coca of a cola. And it contained cocaine. So it was a descriptive brand. Now, one of the things that you have to think about as a marketer is that descriptive brands, if you want to get high levels of trademark protection, actually don't <coughs> generally get high levels of trademark protection because they can become generic for a category. And if a brand becomes generic for a category, it can lose its trademark protection on the principal register. So lots of brands that have um, been introduced and have become sort of generic for a category of product have done things to ensure that their brand doesn't become purely descriptive or generic. And an example of this is the biggest manufacturer of copiers for years, sort of the, the one who introduced the copier uh, on a mass commercialized scale, was a company called Xerox. They're still around, although they're not the major player anymore, to the extent that they were in the copy field. When I was a kid growing up, people would say, go make me a Xerox. And they meant, go make me a copy. So Xerox did this advertisement where they said, you cannot Xerox a Xerox on a Xerox, but you can make a copy on a Xerox copier, because they did not want their, their copier and their brand name to become purely descriptive of a product or category, which was a, a replication on paper of something else, a copy of something else. This happened with something called the Murphy bed, and the Murphy bed case is famous. Murphy beds are these, there was a manufacturer that made these beds that folded up into the wall. These are popular in places like New York City where people live in what are called studio apartments. There's not a lot of room in them. And so in many of these locations, like New York and Chicago, your entire living space is one room, your kitchen, dining room, living room, and bedroom. Well, if you wanted to have company over, it's sort of odd to be sitting there in the middle of your bedroom with the bed out. So they manufactured this product called the Murphy bed that would fold up and into the wall. Murphy bed became generic for a category of product, a folding bed into a wall or a cabinet, and they lost the trademark protection. So one of the things as marketers that you have to think about is if you come up with something that is purely a descriptive brand, you may not be able to get trademark protection for it. That will influence your ability to manage the brand so that you don't have negative associations with it if you can't control that trademark. Then there are person-based brands. You find a lot of these brands in things like the legal field, the accounting field, services fields, because they use people's names. There are associated brands. What's an example of an associated brand? Technically speaking, and they violate this actually in the United States, because I would be willing to bet that if you went to the liquor store today, you could find something called California Champagne. There's really no such thing, technically. And in Europe, you cannot call anything other than a sparkling wine that comes from the Champagne region of France, Champagne. That's an associative brand in that area. Um, in the United States, we don't grant that level of trademark protection to it. But in Europe, if they send it over to, if they send California wines over to Europe, and they have some that are sparkling, they cannot call it Champagne because it's not associated with the Champagne region of France. Which, by the way, if you're interested in wines, there's a really good movie that talks about how California actually produced better wines, and it's called Bottle Shock. Have any of you ever seen that movie? It's a 
It's a really good movie if you're interested in wines. But that's an associated brand. Geographic reference brands. You find these in banking you know, oftentimes. So you have things like the First National Bank of. And then there are alphanumeric brands. Now, a lot of times you'll get these brands that are combinations of these things. So, for example, First National Bank of Guthrie is also it's a geographic reference brand, and it's also an alphanumeric brand. There's one that I add to that typology that you should know. I think there's theme-based branding, and I wrote a paper on this that said that we should include and we should expand the typology to be theme-based. So what's an example of a theme-based brand? And this is usually a test question on the third exam. What's an example of a theme-based brand that you all probably know? If you go right out here to I-35. What's on I-35? Buffalo Wild Wings, Walmart. What did you say? Frontier City, you got five points. Frontier City, that's a theme-based brand. What's the theme? It's a, it's a theme park, and what's their brand? Everything in Frontier City is labeled after what? Frontier. The Frontier Life, the Wild Wild West. So once you develop this, you need to manage the brand. And there are 10 things that Keller says you need to do to effectively manage your brand. First of all, you need to deliver benefits that customers truly desire. So thinking back on the video of Marriott, what is Marriott doing to continue to develop and add benefits that customers truly desire? They recognize, Bill Marriott said, that we're going to run out of locations to build these big box hotels. And also that people, based on their research, they spent a million dollars to figure out that people wanted what? A better room at a cheaper price. So what is Marriott doing in their brand management to stay relevant? What did they tell you that they're doing to stay relevant? They're making a better room at a better price. How are they doing that? Well, they started with a 150-room courtyard in the suburbs of Atlanta. And what else are they doing? They're redesigning the lobby. They're redesigning brand. Uh, uh, brands in their portfolio. So they're coming out with, what did they say? Boutique became very, very popular. So, for example, in Washington, D.C., one of the big boutique hotels is called the Hotel George. And everything in the hotel is based on our first president, George Washington. So they have all of these, like the, the Andy Warhol type pictures. Anybody know who Andy Warhol is? Who's Andy Warhol? Famous artist, and what's he most famous for? Probably. Camel Soup. Camel Soup. Okay. Marilyn Monroe. The Marilyn Monroe, various colors. Um, they do this at the Hotel George. They have they have one dollar bills and sort of an Andy Warhol. I'll give you five points for that. Um, they do this in the Hotel George. So it's this boutique hotel. It's obviously it's in Washington D.C. Washington D.C. is named after. George Washington, so it's a boutique hotel. But there was a lifestyle that goes along with it, but they said that in the video, what was it? The boutique was not doing? It was delighting your senses, it was providing great nightlife, it wasn't providing what? Great service and great night's sleep. So what are they doing to, to manage their brand? They came out with addition, which is a takeoff on boutique that includes the good service that you get at those. So the brand delivers, benefits the customers truly desire, it stays relevant. What is Marriott doing to stay relevant? They're not just relying on that original model, which is we're going to build big box hotels in downtown. They're recognizing that business travelers are getting away from downtown areas, that business centers are moving out of downtown. What is the biggest part of downtown Oklahoma City now? It's not necessarily the business traffic, although it's somewhat become that as a result of Devon moving their tower back down there. But what's a big part of downtown Oklahoma City now? It's Bricktown, and it's tourism. And a lot of the companies have actually moved out. So a lot of, historically, where would companies have like Chesapeake been? They would have been downtown. Where did Chesapeake decide to locate when they built their, their yeah, they decided to build on Classen, and, and they decided they weren't gonna be located in downtown because they wanted a <coughs> campus type feel and so they moved out of the downtown area. So what is Marriott doing? Well, Courtyard was designed with those kinds of people in mind. They have a Courtyard right over on Classen that appeals to those kinds of business travelers that are in 
those office areas that are now clustering and popping up around Class and Curve and around Northwest 63rd Street. The pricing strategy is based on customers' perceptions of value. This is really critical. And we will talk about pricing here, and I will tell you this, and I'll tell you it again in the pricing lecture. There is no one theoretical uh, foundation for why you should set price, but the price does have to be right, and customers' perceptions are enormously important in that pricing, uh, in that pricing uh, proposition. You have to position your product uh, correctly, and we'll talk about this when we get into, um, we talked about it in targeting, segmenting, and positioning, but also in, in integrated marketing communication. How do you get that, how do you make that connection in the mind of the consumer? And then finally, you should be consistent in your message. If you're not consistent in your message, your consumer will define your message for you, and that's not necessarily what you want to have happen. You don't want to have a bottled message. Your brand portfolio and hierarchy have to make sense. Again, I've said this before, with regard to business diversification, it is not clear that it is a priori a good thing. What in the video makes the Marriott hierarchy and brand portfolio, many brands under one umbrella, so they've got Courtyard, they've got Residence, they've got Edition, they've got Ritz-Carlton, they've got Marriott, they've got Fairfield, all of these, what is it that makes sense about that, so if I ask you a question that says, you know, so-and-so has many brands under one portfolio, Fairfield, blah, 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 what is this an example of? Well, it's an example of, in the theoretical foundations provided by Turley and Moore, the idea that, or in, in Kevin Lane Keller, that the brand portfolio and hierarchy makes sense. Why does that hierarchy and portfolio make sense in Marriott? They're all what? What are all of those brands? Are they? They're all lodging. They're all lodging. What wouldn't make sense in terms of having a brand portfolio? Well, what, did, what, what, what happened with Donald Trump and Trump stakes? Donald Trump is a brand, the Trump brand. What is the Trump brand known for? They're known for building. And so he decided at one point in time, we're going to have Trump stakes. And it was, even though he showed it on, on his campaign, he said, here are Trump stakes. They, they, you can't buy Trump stakes anymore. Why is it that that didn't make sense in the brand portfolio? That's not what he's known for. His steak, when you think steak, you don't think Trump. You think what? Catalans. You think Catalans or Outback or something else, you don't think steak. Trump airline, they had a Trump airline. It went broke, why? Again, it doesn't fit within the hierarchy of the portfolio. You know, when you, when you thought of airlines, what, what do most people want from an airline? Now, I mean, for the, for the most part, most of you, when you travel, you only care about one thing, which is what? What? Price. Most of you care nothing about anything other than price. That's it. How many of you are brand loyal to an airline? Why? Which airline are you brand loyal to? Southwest. Southwest. I, I am actually loyal. I'm brand loyal to Southwest as well because I have the luxury. They're not always the cheapest though anymore. And for, for you guys at this point in your life, most of you are very price sensitive. And so if you want to travel, you don't want to spend money on the airline, you want to spend money on what? Experiences. The experience at the, end of the, at the end of the airline trip, right? They're the destination, and so you don't really care about you know, whether or not you go first class at this point in your life. When you, you know, get older, you'll start caring about those things. But most people are price sensitive. It didn't, that didn't make sense. Trump's airline didn't make sense in the brand portfolio. Everything that Marriott does, they got out of the restaurant business, by the way, and they don't really manage their restaurants anymore. They outsource that. They got out of that business, and they're in the hotel business. And all of these things under that brand portfolio all relate to lodging. They all relate to lodging and, and hotels. 
Um, the brand uses the full repertoire of marketing activities to build equity. So what are they doing in Marriott to build brand equity? Well, they have a great website. <laughs> they're advertising. They're developing the, all four Ps. They're developing new products. They understand what those products mean in the mind of the consumer. They're positioning them correctly. So they're using the full repertoire of marketing activities to build equity. The brand managers understand what it means. I think Bill Marriott understands what the Marriott name means. And that's one of the things that in the video Arnie Sorneson said, I pity the person who has to follow Bill Marriott because he knows what this brand means. And so understanding that, what the brand means to the consumer. Giving the brand proper support. There are lots of products that are good products and interesting products, but they don't get the proper support. What's an example of this? How many of you remember the car company Saturn? Okay. What happened to Saturn? It went broke, right? Why did it go broke? It didn't have the proper support of the company. The model for Saturn was supposed to be a different. Who actually developed Saturn? Anybody know? Who said it? I'll give you five points. GM developed Saturn. What happened was, they developed this and it was supposed to be a new car company. First of all, it was supposed to be cheaper, better, better quality, more reliable, and the model was going to be different than all other models. It was going to be a no-haggle pricing model that they used. That meant that their dealerships that were GM dealers didn't buy in. They also were going to produce it in non or in what we call right-to-work states. Now, right-to-work states are sort of a misnomer. It didn't mean that you have the right to a job in a right to work state. What does a right to work state mean? It means that you cannot be forced to pay for collective bargaining if you do not want to do that. Most of GM's workforce live in non right to work states. And so you had labor unions that were opposed to it, you had a dealership that was opposed to it, and you had management that didn't really buy into it into the model, and it turned out to be a miserable failure because the company didn't give it the proper support that it needed to succeed, and it went broke. The company monitors sources of brand equity constantly, so you have to do this all the time. You cannot get lax in this. Coca-Cola is a prime example of doing this. Why is it that when you go to a restaurant, if they do not carry Coca-Cola products and you say, give me a Coke, they will, they, Coke sends little spies out to monitor, and if you give them a Pepsi, they will sue you because they monitor that brand equity and they know what that brand name means in the mind of the consumer. So monitoring that um, constantly. How do you do this? You watch feedback, you do market research. In this day and age, it's very easy to monitor it. In my family's business, the way we do it is we constantly, we're in the lodging and, and, and hospitality business, we constantly monitor our TripAdvisor ratings and make, and make adjustments based on the feedback that we get from that, um, from that source. Living the brand. One of the things that we try to do now is we try to market to our employees as well and get them to engage in what we call living the brand. Southwest is the best example of this. They, they don't pay their employees the best of any of the airlines but they have the most committed and brand loyal employees because they support them in a variety of ways and they actually get them to live the brand. So organizations, particularly large businesses, act through their agents. They act through their employees that interact with customers on a daily basis. And so understanding that is important. These agents impact the customer's perception of the organization. Why is it that people love Southwest? It's a cattle call, but they're fun about it. I will never forget, I came back to Oklahoma when I was getting my PhD. One of my friends, who had been a vice president with me at the American Education Corporation, took pity on me because I, was, I had gone from being an executive vice president of a publicly traded company to being a graduate student at New Mexico State, not having a big income. And so I love, I've told you all this before, I love the Oklahoma State. It's amazing to me what people would rather 
have than their own money. So he said, you know, I'd really like for you to come back to the fair because it's just such an entertaining thing to go to the fair with you. And he sent me a ticket that he used from our company miles. He has all of these miles built up from traveling, and they're on America. And so I get to the airport in, in El Paso, and I'm waiting to board my flight. And I actually had a first class ticket on American Airlines because he had all these points and he said, here's, you know, here's a ticket. And so um, he bought it and I'm staying in the first class, you know, line. And the ticket agent is like a completely termagant, horrible person. I mean, and I'm like, if this is the way you treat first class, I, and that's not atypical. Why has American gone bankrupt three times? Because they're horrible. Their employees don't live the brand. And it's reflective in everything that they do. Southwest, it's a cattle call. It's open seating. The only thing that you get in Southwest is if you get in that first AA list. You know, get to choose a better seat. <clears throat> but people love it because the experience is overall great. Their employees, I've never, <coughs> I've never had somebody tell me that they had a bad experience with a Southwest employee overall. Um, so agents that live the brand consistently project the image of the organization's vision and values and culture. And it's really, really important in this era of value co-creation that we develop this and that we try to do this and we try to instill this in our employees, this idea of living the brand. <coughs> That's it. I hope you all have a safe, happy, and wonderful spring break. And uh, be careful out there. Try not to you know, run into any trees on the slopes of Colorado or wherever it is that you're headed for uh, a vacation.